one. There a discussion between a college receptionist, Denise, and a student named VJ about learning a language. In the first part of the discussion, they are talking about the course VJ will study. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Hello, may I help you? Hello,、uh, is this the right place for me to register to study foreign languages? Yes, it is. May I have your name, please? Vijay. My family name is Paresh. Vijay Paresh. Okay. Do you have a telephone number? Yeah, nine zero nine two four six seven. Thank you. Now, which language would you like to learn? We offer French, Italian, Cantonese, Mandarin, Spanish, Portuguese.、Uh, I'd like to learn Spanish, please. Okay. Our classes are conducted in lots of different places. We have classrooms in the city and here in this building. What's this building called? This is Building A.、Hmm. I work near here, so it'd be best to study in Building A. What time do you want to come to lessons? They go on for three hours, and they start at ten a.m., four p.m., and six p.m. I wish I could come to the daytime lessons, but I can't. So six p.m., please. That's our most popular time, of course.、Um, have you ever studied Spanish before? No, I haven't. We describe our classes by level and number. Your class is called Elementary One. Okay.、Uh, when will classes start? Elementary One begins.、Uh, just a minute.、Uh, it begins on August ten. Great. Now, what else do I have to do? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen, and answer questions eight to ten. I'm sorry, VJ. What were you saying? I wanted to know what else I had to do. Oh, of course. Please go to the building on the other side of Smith Street. I want you to go to the reception area first. It's just inside the door on the left as you enter from Smith Street. Give them this form. Okay. Do I pay my fees there? No, but the fees office is in the same building. Go past the escalators, and you'll see a games shop. It's in the corner. The fees office is between the games shop and the toilets. Thanks.、Uh, where can I buy books? The bookshop is opposite the lifts. It's right next to the entrance from Robert Street. Your offices are spread out. Not as badly as they used to be. By the way, we offer very competitive overseas travel rates to our students. Oh, I'd like to look into that. Of course, the travel agency is at the Smith Street end of the building, in the corner next to the insurance office. Thank you very much. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. First, Now turn to have part two to look at questions eleven to sixteen.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Good afternoon. Hello. How can I help you? I'd like to make a transfer, please. You want to transfer some money? That's fine. Let me just bring up some details. Right. Here we are. Can you tell me your name, please? It's Alice Del Tour. OK. And your date of birth? 20th of February, 1982. Right, and for security, can I have the first letter of your password? It's B. And the fifth letter? That's F. Fine. Now, where do you want to make the transfer to and from? I'd like to send money from my current account abroad. Which country are you sending it to? To China. My boyfriend is on holiday there, and he's run out of money. Oh dear. China, OK. Now, there are several ways to do this. We can do it by credit card, by electronic transfer, by cheque or by banker's draft. Um, I'm not sure. What's the best way? Well, that all depends. The simplest way is by cheque, really. I just write the cheque and send it. Yes, but it can be very slow and take a long time for the money to clear. Between three to four weeks. How soon do you need the money to get there? I'd like it to get there in the next couple of weeks. So really, sending a cheque is going to be too slow. Yes, I think so. Let's look at electronic transfer then. This usually takes between two and five working days. That's two to five days. Working or business days. If you send it on Friday, it will get there the following Friday at the latest. I see. That's much better. Yes, but we do charge a fee for this. We charge a flat fee of £21, and on top of that, the receiving bank may charge a fee, and an agent may also charge you for transferring the money between banks. So, how much is it altogether? We can't give you an exact amount. You need to check it with the receiving bank and any agents that they use. I see. Also, you can send it in sterling or dollars from here, but there will be an additional fee depending on the exchange rate when you convert it into renminbi. So, there will be another charge too? I'm afraid so. Does it make any difference if I send it in dollars or sterling? It could make a difference according to which currency has the best exchange rate. The other difference is this. If you send dollars, the amount goes through the US clearing system. We send the money to our branch in London. They then send it to our branch in New York, and the New York branch sends it to the bank in China. It goes all around the world, then. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. What about if I send sterling? In that case, we send it to our branch in London. From there, it may go directly to China, unless the bank in China has an agent in London, in which case we transfer it to the London agent and they send the money on to China. So how do I proceed with the transfer? OK, first we'll need some details about the beneficiary from you. The who? The beneficiary, the person receiving the money. OK, what do you need to know? We'll need the full name of the beneficiary and their account number. OK. You need to tell us the name of the bank in China and the address of the branch. We also need the bank's sort code and the SWIFT number. What's a SWIFT number? Basically, it's an interbank code. It helps banks identify each other through a unique code number. OK. And that's spelt? S-W-I-F-T. SWIFT. And the final thing we need is the reason for sending the money. You need a reason from me? I just told you my boyfriend's run out of money. Well, we don't need a reason. The receiving government needs to know why the money is entering the country and we have to be able to tell them. OK. So, from me you need the bank's name, the address of the branch, the sort code and SWIFT number, the beneficiary's name and account number and a reason for sending the payment. Yes, that's correct. OK, so I'll check these out and come back to you with them 
so we can go ahead with the transfer. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear some students talking about an art assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. What have you been working on, Arthur? I've been looking into the funding of the arts by the Arts Association. Oh, Mr Simpson gave you that topic, did he? Yes, it's not too difficult. At least all the facts and figures are easy to find, or I think they will be. <laughs> I've done a lot of useful stuff already. Simpson hasn't asked me to present my research for the past few seminars, so I think he might ask me this time. Hmm. Well, what have you found out? Well, it's big money at the Arts Association. £330 million from the government and £118 million from the lottery. Mm -hmm. Let me see. I've got my notes here. Now... The Arts Association mission statement tells us that it exists to develop, sustain and promote the arts. Mm. So that's clear. But then we need to know exactly how it can do this. However, before we get to that, there are certain issues which the Association must take into account. What are those issues? They are, first, access. This is the idea that the arts mustn't be just for the few. Not just Italian opera, but pop concerts too. Something like that. Other issues are education, cultural diversity, social regeneration and social inclusion. Hmm. All these are different ways of saying that the arts are for everyone. All right, but what does it actually do? It does what it wants, I think. The government does not interfere in its activities, but demands that it gets value for money for its funds. But there must be certain programmes that it carries out. Oh, yes. There is the touring programme, mm. which is what it says. That is, a programme to support... Give money to. Yes, that's right. To support touring companies, mm. for example, dance companies, orchestras and so on. There is also the recovery programme. What on earth is that? Uh, it's a financial programme to give extra money to organisations which are financially in a bad way or which might have financial difficulties in the future. Mm. Like it says, it's for their recovery. It all seems very complicated. Uh, it is. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Did you get any information on the reading for the other half of our work? 
Yes, I did. You mean the Art and Society module? Yes. Yes. I met Simpson himself as we were waiting for a train at Norchester Station, so I managed to ask him. Any luck? Yes. I've got the notes I took here. Oh. He told me, of course, to start with Greenberg, mm. who covers contemporary art and the up-to-the-minute movements in America. It's about the modern movements, really. As far as the economic impact of art is concerned, a basic text is the Parliamentary Report on Art and the UK Economy. Mm. This gives lots of monetary facts and figures, but the figures are not very satisfactory, as, of course, a lot of the information is confidential and can't be published. Art Now, Art Well by someone called Denison sounds exciting and is about how art and artists are created, presented for buyers and sold in the US. It's about the whole trade in art as a phenomenon. Like a product? Like washing powder? Yes. <laughs> That's the idea of the book, anyway. <sighs> And there's another one here. Oh, yes, by someone called Hampton. It's a book called American Art, which Simpson says is full of discussion on the relationship of art to the other aspects of culture, such as film, television, books and so on. Popular culture, I suppose. Not just popular. Culture of all sorts, I imagine. Finally... For the spiritual and more abstract aspects of art, he recommends Art and the Mind of Modern Man by Frick. Mm. It's sort of about how art relates to how we think. He did have lots of other recommendations, but luckily his train arrived before he could move on to them. <laughs> These seem enough to me. <laughs> yes, they're a good place to start. We will be busy. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sally Miller, and I'm here to offer you some advice on legal matters whilst you are studying at this university. Happily, most international students complete their courses without running into any serious legal problems. But if you do find yourself involved in a legal dispute of any kind, ask for help. There are two options. First, contact the student's union or welfare officer. Even if they cannot help you directly, they should be able to advise you where to go for help. The second possibility is to contact the Citizens Advice Bureau in your area. You can find them in the local telephone directory. They will be able to recommend a solicitor if you need one and tell you if there is a local law centre providing free legal advice. They will also be able to tell you whether you can claim legal aid to help pay for any court and legal fees. Let me give you some basic information about the police. The police have the power to stop and search anyone who appears to be behaving in a suspicious manner. If you are arrested for any reason, even if you know it to be a wrong reason, remember a few very important things. One don't be aggressive. 2. Do not try to bribe the police officer. 3. 
If you are arrested by plain clothes police officers, ask to see some form of identification. 4. Give your true name and address if the officer asks you to. Lying to the police is a criminal offence. 5. Do not sign any statement until you have received advice from a solicitor. There is always a solicitor on duty at every police station. 6. You will be entitled to make one telephone call. If you use this call to telephone a friend, urge your friend to contact someone from your university or from the student's union and get advice about what you should do next. If you find yourself in trouble with the police, it is very important to get professional advice. Contact any of the following. Your university welfare officer, the student's union at your university, your local citizen's advice bureau, a local law centre. If you are found guilty of an offence, it could seriously damage your position as an international student, so be sure to ask for help as early in the process as possible. Remember, obey the local laws. The laws here may not be quite the same as in your own country. Here are a few examples of actions that are illegal here. It is against the law to possess offensive weapons. For example, knives, guns, chemical sprays used for personal defense, even women are not allowed to carry sprays or other deterrents to protect themselves against possible assault, except for rape alarms, possess or supply hard or soft drugs, disturb the peace. This is called disorderly conduct. This means that you can be arrested for being too noisy or rowdy. A few words about drinking. In this country, it is perfectly acceptable for adults to drink alcohol in moderate amounts. For many people, drinking is an established part of their social life. Going out for a drink is how they relax or spend time with friends. If you go to a party or visit people at home in the evening, your host will probably offer you a drink. Often a lot of university social life can revolve around drinking, especially for undergraduates. Do not be surprised if people arrange to meet in a bar or if events are held in a pub. But you are not obliged to drink alcohol if you do not want to, even if you are in a pub or at a party where everyone else is drinking. You can always ask for a non-alcoholic drink instead. And, if you feel uncomfortable going to places that serve alcohol, explain this to your friends. There are lots of other places where you can meet. If you do choose to drink, remember that you should never drive a motor vehicle after drinking alcohol. It is dangerous, and the police can impose serious penalties on you. Also, remember that being drunk in public is not acceptable either, and the police can arrest you for it. Drugs and alcohol can cause serious problems. Let me repeat that in this country it is illegal to use drugs, except under medical supervision. But if you do use illegal drugs and you develop a problem, there are organisations you can contact. Contact your student's union or your student counsellor. Anyone over 18 years old can legally buy and consume alcoholic drinks in this country. But if you think you might be drinking too much, get help and advice from your student counsellor or your doctor. Again, there are special organisations that can help you with drug and alcohol problems. Contact them. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.